So achieving net zero emissions in the UK, as is required under the legally binding Climate Change Act, will require emissions to be reduced across the economy in all the different sectors. But alongside that, there will be some residual sources of emissions that are very difficult or impossible to abate, and this will require some amount of greenhouse gas removals. Achieving that requires some things to happen today. For instance, we need to have signals about a market and what market mechanisms might be used to incentivise greenhouse gas removals and particularly to ensure their sustainability standards. We also need to think about which technologies might work in the UK, support research and development efforts to try and find out which ones are appropriate to use. And finally, there are things we need to get on with today, such as planting trees. Trees take time, time to sequester carbon, so the sooner we can get started planting at a good scale, we're also trying to achieve other objectives with land use, such as maintaining biodiversity and um, improving resilience to climate changes here in the UK. Um, that will help make sure that the land can contribute to storing carbon as much as possible by the time we reach that 2050 uh, deadline year. I think in addition to the policies we've been pursuing over the last three decades around reducing the demand for fossil fuels, such as through renewable energy and energy efficiency, we also need to start looking seriously at winding down fossil fuels at their source, so keeping more and more fossil fuels in the ground. And we can see that there's a lot of advantages to policies that do this. It can be more cost effective than demand side policies alone. It can avoid lock-in uh, of fossil fuel development pathways and these types of policies might also be easier to administer and mobilize more public support. So it's an exciting area to be looking at right now. Also uh, with regard to NDC enhancement as well as the UN Secretary General Summit, a real way to boost countries' ambition. I, my priority for net zero emissions would be the built environment. Twofold. Think about the buildings that are going up all around the world now that are the same old, same old concrete, glass and steel, regardless of the climate. And it's something of a horror story to me, particularly that so many of these buildings are going up in hot parts of the world and they're going to be hard to live in without some form of artificial mechanical cooling with all the energy implications of that. So it's draw on all the wisdom there is in your country about climate appropriate buildings and design sane buildings for a warming climate. Um, and also look at the built environment that we already have here and what the, the, the gains that you can make for energy, for environment and for people's comfort by retrofitting those buildings. Okay, well obviously it remains critically important to decarbonise the economy, but if we really want to achieve net zero in a meaningful time frame, we need to massively scale up finance for and implementation of nature-based solutions. So we need to be protecting and managing our biodiverse carbon-rich ecosystems, particularly in the tropics. We need to be investing in the restoration of our natural ecosystems across the world. We need to be bringing green and blue infrastructure into cities and we need to be adapting our agricultural practices so they incorporate nature-based approaches. And um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for nature-based solutions and, and people are talking about them at this conference as well and they're going to be featuring really prominently at the UN Climate Summit um, next week. But the problem is when a lot of people, perhaps especially in the corporate sector, are talking about nature-based solutions, they're thinking of sort of large-scale afforestation, so big plantations with single species. And the problem is with that is that those plantations have very low resilience, um, they have very low biodiversity, they don't provide the whole raft of ecosystem goods and services on which people depend. And I think moving forward, I think we, it's really important not to pitch green solutions against grey solutions. What we need to look for is portfolios of solutions. I mean, these things work together and mustn't uh, detract from one another. Um, but one of the important things is to mention is that, you know, across a lot of the world, particularly in the tropics and the subtropics and the developing world, they can't afford a high-tech um, fix to climate change. They can't rely on these sort of very, very expensive technologies to do carbon dioxide removal. And they also have really high dependency on the natural environment. So it makes sense for them to invest in and to scale up nature-based solutions. CO2 storage has is, is always been in the mix and with the net zero demand really, it's created a very clear demand for 2050 and also for 2030. Um, 
CO2 storage is an essential component. The International Energy Agency uh, anticipate that CO2 storage will provide about a third of those emissions reductions by 2050 and 14% by 2030. So in a European context, that means about 600 million tonnes of storage by 2030 and about 17 billion tonnes or gigatons of storage by 2050, which is a lot. Uh, from a storage rate point of view, um, we've been storing about a million tonnes a year in the North Sea and by 2025 we need to be storing 10 million tonnes. By 2030 we need to be storing 100 million tonnes a year and by 2050 we need to be storing over a thousand million tonnes a year. So you can break that down into good injection wells. That's a thousand injection wells in 2050. That's over a hundred injection wells by 2028. Um, the technology requires building, it's about 10 years and so at this point we're off trend. We, we really uh, we need financing, we need the political will. And the grassroots political will is here, so it, it's really getting to a European-wide uh, certificate financing of CO2 storage. Okay, so I think a priority would be to start to demonstrate our research. So we've done lots of research where we've scoped out the options and we think we know what, how some of the benefits and co-benefits and trade-offs might play out. But I think what we need to do now is we need to move to the scale of the demonstration. And ideally it would be a, a project on a fairly large area of land where we could try out a whole bunch of different technologies. So we might, we might, have, we might try out growing bioenergy for BECs. We could try looking at soil carbon sequestration. We could look at spreading enhanced uh, in, uh, minerals on the soil for enhanced weathering. Uh, we could try afforestation and try to fit those in, in the places that they work best and monitor it really closely, take all the measurements that we can um, so that we learn by doing. And then through that, I think that we're getting, starting to move over up those technology readiness levels from what we currently know about, which is the research, through into the scale of implementation. So for me, large scale demonstration projects with multiple different negative emissions technologies or greenhouse gas removal options all being played out with real close monitoring, maybe getting in experts from different groups to, to all work in one area. That's what I would say is my priority. I think net zero is really cru crucial for the sustainability of the Earth system, but the real question is how do we get there and what kind of pathways do we adopt? And when we're talking about pathways, we inherently need to talk about sustainable pathways. And what I mean here by sustainability is those pathways which have equitable outcomes, which are imbued with the spirit of equity and fairness at, for fair futures. And that is where I see net zero going. So while a massive action needs to really happen in reducing fossil fuel emissions, I, I want to make a case for protecting the high carbon, higher biodiverse ecosystems because once that carbon's gone, it's really hard to get back. But even harder to get back is a biodiversity. So something that focuses on protecting these ecosystems in a way that is socially just, um, supports indigenous people and local communities. I think um, the, the biggest priority at the moment is just to get on with it um, because we know that every tonne of CO2 we emit now uh, is, is contributing to ongoing continued global warming. So if we can start um, with the action sooner rather than later, that will be less to scrub out of the atmosphere later. So really it's up to governments to make strong policies so that businesses and industries can, can actually take action. And then if you're within um, uh, a company or a business or an organisation taking some action now and getting the ball rolling on how these uh, systems and institutions can actually change. I think that's the most important thing because change takes time. You can't just change overnight no matter how much you want to. So the sooner we get started, the better. I think it has to be a policy change. I mean, we've heard from this meeting that the, the technologies are there to reduce emissions, it can be done, we now need the incentives, we need the, the bit of warmth behind it and we've declared a climate emergency, that's step one, but now we've actually got to do something about it and although there's been some investment, I think it's 30 million pounds or so, it's got to be 300 million, no, 30 billion pounds in order to really make this happen and I think that there's all sorts of opportunities for the UK to take the lead in this if we really get going and make it happen fast.